morning, everybody. Um, and, and welcome back to the Global Neurosciences Institute in Grand Rounds. And now it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce our own Dr. Errol Vesnadorovlu. Dr. Vez is a highly experienced and internationally renowned cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. He is currently a professor and holds the Robert Croft Chair in Neurosurgery appointment at Drexel University College of Medicine. Dr. Vez, as he's known, is the chair uh, of the Global Neurosciences Institute and leads a team of expert neurosurgeons and neurosur neurologists specializing in complex brain conditions. He's trained in both uh, traditional neurosurgical approaches and endovascular approaches, offering his patients a wide range of treatment options. Dr. Vez's areas of expertise include the treatment of aneurysm, arteriovenous malformations, stroke, caramel malformations, and other brain and cerebrovascular conditions. Aside from his clinical work, Dr. Vez is also uh, involved in numerous clinical and basic science studies related to cerebrovascular diseases and is an esteemed academic leader in the field of cerebrovascular care. He teaches national courses for residents and fellows in complex vascular neurosurgery. His groundbreaking clinical trials have transformed the standard of care for neurologic emergences, and he continues to develop the uh, patent innovative treatments and devices for stroke and aneurysms. Dr. Vess has co-authored articles published in the New England Journal of Medicine and serves as the editor of the textbook Controversies in Cerebrovascular Neurosurgery. He is recognized as a top doctor and has received various awards for his contributions to healthcare. Dr. Vess will be talking today about care for patients with care malformations and the concept of a single center to promote that care. Dr. Vess. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, I don't think I have to say anything more after that. It's like, good night, everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, uh, glad to uh, kick off our first uh, grand rounds of uh, the year and a huge thank you uh, to Peter and Nicole Myers um, uh, for putting all this together uh, year after year. So let me share my screen here. So uh, today what I'm going to talk about is um, one of the few things I do outside of vascular and have been doing for quite a while um, are Arnold Chiari malformations or Chiaris. Um, the concept of uh, a center of excellence or, or basically a umbrella center for Chiari malformations is something long overdue um, because even though it's um, you know, a simple concept, uh, the disease of Chiari malformation, which I, I wanna impart this morning is, is a lot more complex I think than most people think. So uh, my disclosure is really the only ones that are relevant. Um, I'm on the board of ASAP, which is a .gov organization and not-for-profit uh, for care malformations and uh, a recipient of the Siri Research Grant, which I'm gonna talk about for medical marijuana. So essentially in about 30 seconds in this slide, I can, I can sum up care malformation. You see the red area, arrow, uh, arrow there. That is the uh, cerebellar tonsils that are herniated um, a little bit below the frame and magnum. And this entity here is really what a Chiari malformation is. And what it causes is an obstruction of cerebral spinal fluid at the level of the frame and magnum. And what this does is the CSF becomes blocked in the cervical canal as well as the cranial vault. And that causes a consolation of symptoms. So as you can see with this kind of cork in a bottle, the CSF cannot freely circulate and what can end up happening is pressure headaches, particularly in the back of the head, although they can be anywhere. Um, obstruction of flow can cause hydrocephalus and then ultimately a syrinx in the high cervical cord. Um, so if it's that simple, you know, why is there all the controversy with Chiari? And there's tons. And if anyone has a question about that, just go and Google Chiari malformation. Um, and you can imagine as a patient, especially if you have an incidental finding, it's, it's very uh, confusing and alarming. So first and foremost, the definition of Chiari is not agreed upon. You know, what is a Chiari malformation? Is it five millimeters of cerebellar descent into the frame and magnum? Is it symptoms? Um, is it the evidence of a syrinx? So there's a lot of debate about what we even define as a Chiari. Um, and they're also more common than people think. Um, they're found incidentally in uh, almost 1% of the population. That's over 3 million people a year. And certainly not everybody is symptomatic and or needs surgery. So the symptoms are very common. Um, things like headache, neck pain, 
which can be masked um, with a lot of other entities that are a lot more common than Chiari. And then the big one is the difference age uh, of peds and adults. And I'm gonna go over the difference and try to simplify that because technically there are five subtypes of Chiari. Unfortunately, as providers and surgeons, we tend to lump peds and adults into one category. Um, that still happens um, as of today. Um, and they're very, very different entities. Um, and then treatment, you know, who and what treatment, you know, which patients um, are going to gain the, the most from undergoing surgery. So I want to really, really briefly um, give a crash course in uh, level of evidence and uh, class recommendation for studies. This is one of the problems. So when we talk about uh, levels of evidence, there's one through five. The highest is level one. There's virtually almost no level one evidence um, for anything that we do clinically um, or in science for that matter. It's very difficult to have a randomized controlled trial, which is essentially what that is. Um, you get down to level five, which is basically personal observation and just, well, I think this works. Chiari malformation data um, and surgery is really between level three and level four. Most of these are meta-analysis um, very small retrospective cohort studies, and a lot of them are case series. So we don't have really good levels of evidence. And then if we all remember the classes, so classes are recommendations, class one through three, um, recommending whether the treatment um, in question is valid. So class one, again, is the highest, it's recommended and indicated. Um, it's a general agreement that a given treatment for a procedure is beneficial, useful, and effective. Um, most of what we do falls into class two. And again, Chiari falls into class 2A, 2B of either should be considered or may be considered. Um, opinions in favor, um, efficacy is well established um, by evidence and opinion. So again, just a quick background to give us an idea of you know, why things aren't more clear because we just don't have the studies and the data. So let's talk about what is a Chiari? What constitutes a Chiari? Is it five or three millimeters of cerebellar descent? Um, there's varying uh, uh, opinions on that. Um, most providers will agree that five millimeters uh, or more constitutes a Chiari. And that's certainly what most of our radiology colleagues um, will call on a radiology report. And again, many times this is incidental or they'll say low lying cerebellar tonsils if it doesn't quite meet the five millimeters, but five millimeters is really the cutoff. Is there a syrinx or not? Um, and we'll talk about uh, uh, what that is, but it's a cystic cavity in the cervical cord due to the buildup of CSF pressure due to the obstruction. Cine flow. Um, is there obstruction of uh, cerebral spinal fluid at the frame and magnum, which we can see by a MRI study called the Cine flow. And then most importantly, symptoms. Um, there are some that would advocate now for something called the Chiari Zero, where even though there's a completely normal MRI and the symptoms fit with the Chiari, that that's a Chiari. So classification. So let's, let's kind of clarify that really for the intents of this discussion, and I think anybody thinking of Chiari's really should bundle it into uh, type one and type two. Chiari one is what we're gonna talk about is the most common uh, found in adults uh, later in life. Chiari two um, is a pediatric and usually um, found at birth. Um, and that's where there's a myelomeningus seal. And we'll show you what that looks like. Chiari three, um, is uh, again, uh, usually in neonates, uh, uh, babies are born with this and what they have is what's called an encephalocele. So instead of having an opening in their spine, it's uh, higher up and I'll show you some pictures of that. And then Chiari four is basically cere cerebellar hypoplasia. Um, and then there's a Chiari five, which is basically absence, but many would argue that these don't really fit in with Chiari. So to add to the confusion, Chiari zero is a, a new popular trend. Um, which I think is a surgeon looking for a uh, case. Um, basically, there's no anatomic Chiari um, and the symptoms fit with Chiari syndrome, not Chiari malformation, but Chiari syndrome and surgery is recommended for those patients. Um, I just bring it up because if you hear about it, 
Um, most people um, do not believe in this, or you know, if you if you talk to most neurosurgeons who do Chiari malformations, you bring up Chiari zero, they'll roll their eyes. Um, Chiari uh, one and a half or one point five is essentially another person groups multiple, you know, kind of wanting to describe it better, but I think sometimes that just confuses things. It's a regular Chiari, but there's such herniation that the brainstem starts to herniate. And then Chiari syndrome versus malformation. Syndrome are just clinical symptoms, whereas the malformation is really the anatomic finding of that cerebellar descent. So let's talk about type two. Um, so this is basically failure of the neural folds during embryogenesis to meet. I'll show you what that looks like. Um, these babies have very small posterior fossas, um, presents uh, in neonates, so at birth, um, and a myelomeningocele is present in 100% of cases. And you can see these poor little guys and gals. This is what this looks like. And if you look at the bottom screen, you can make out, you can see this kind of split where it almost looks like a little hot dog bun. Um, those are the neural folds right there. So this is where you can see the spinal cord. This is what the spinal cord looks like. There's these two tubes that come together once they mature, they never come together. And literally the spinal cord uh, and the lumbar spine is completely exposed with this sac um, containing the CSF. And so the first uh, uh, thing that we do in these kids is uh, do a shunt almost always because if you don't do the shunt, the, the, there's hydrocephalus almost in every one of these babies. Um, this will just keep leaking and leaking and leaking. So we do a shunt and then repair this. And Dr. Lovin um, can speak to this. So Chiari 1. So now that I hope I didn't confuse you more, but kind of put in context, we're going to really talk about Chiari 1. Um, this is the adult form, the most common form. And what we see is uh, peg-like or herniation of the cerebellar tonsils below the foramen magnum. Now, it's important to point out that there's a spectrum across ages. Um, as we're younger, the brain is smaller, tighter, so we um, can uh, uh, expect a little bit more normal herniation. As we get older, the brain shrinks, and we would expect the brain to retract. So Kids less than 10 years old, the cutoff is generally recommended at six millimeters is abnormal. That's six millimeters of descent. Um, most adults greater than 30, um, five millimeters, and then four millimeters for 80 years old and older. And of course, there's obviously variations. So getting back to the pediatrics and adults, um, we were a part of a, um, a study uh, at uh, Washington National Children's with six other centers and um, some colleagues uh, through the ASAP organization, um, you know, wanted to really look at what it, what are the differences between peds and adults? Because we can't keep recommending the same types of treatments, expecting the same types of results. And this is a really important study um, that actually is submitted with revisions at this point, um, looking at over 300 patients, 170 adults, 153 pediatric patients. And really the take home is this, that the, it shows clear differences between pediatric and adults um, in terms of demographics, radiographic finding, presentation of symptoms, surgical indications, and outcomes. Um, so what do we need you know, is more prospective studies. Again, getting back to the earlier discussion, um, and that's in the works as we speak. Um, and uh, this is um, due to a lot of great work from the team uh, at uh, Washington Children's. So let's get back to our Chiari uh, uh, malformation. So five millimeters of cerebellar descent, that's it. You see on radiographic findings, patients have symptoms, they get surgery, right? Pretty easy. Well, let's start with the five millimeters of cerebellar descent. So it's pretty well known that there's a lot of variation in measurements. So at any given time, that five millimeters could be four millimeters, it could be six millimeters. This is a dynamic pro process with pulsation of CSF in the posterior fossa. And we know for a fact that if a patient undergoes a sitting um, or lying MRI uh, or standing for that matter, uh, sitting, standing versus lying, there's greater descent in the standing patient than there is lying. Um, and, and this has been shown over and over again, just due to gravity and due to pressure differentials in the head. So we have to keep in mind that that five millimeters is not necessarily fixed. So the constellations that also 
make this these patients complex is that up to a quarter of the patients will have hydrocephalus. Um, again, uh, thought due to be the obstruction of flow of CSF at the frame and magnum. What they'll get is a syrinx because the buildup of cerebral spinal fluid pressure, both in the head, but also in the spinal canal, there's nowhere for that CSF to go. So it basically gravitates by osmosis into the uh, uh, central canal and develops this uh, syrinx. So let's quickly talk about the epidemiology. Um, average age of presentations, uh, usually uh, late 30s, early 40s. Um, female um, is a one to three predominance. Um, the average duration of symptoms before diagnosis is up to three years, which also complicates things because let's think about what these symptoms are. These symptoms are headaches, neck pain, myalgias, very, very common findings. And these patients usually present to their primary care physician and Chiari is not number one on the differential, nor should it be. Um, if you include headache alone, that expands out to seven years before patients are, are diagnosed. And they're uh, often, again, appropriately diagnosed and treated for their headaches. Presents in adulthood, um, syringomyelia is present in up to 20%. Um, patients that are symptomatic, up to 40% of those patients will have a syrinx. Um, and hydrocephalus, as I mentioned, is up to a quarter of these patients. And it's also important to note that they're not going to have whopping hydrocephalus often on their films. The hydrocephalus is not identified because that CSF is being evenly distributed throughout the uh, uh, CSF space going into the uh, um, uh, CSF, uh, I'm sorry, into the CFS, CSF space into the central canal. So often we don't see the hydrocephalus until after we do Chiari surgery and that CSF starts to build up and we get patch grafts, which will, uh, uh, leaks, which we'll talk a little bit about. So symptoms, pain, is a great majority of patient uh, symptomatology. Um, up to 70% of patients, that's the presenting complaint. Um, and that can be bundled into headache, neck pain, girdle pain, arm, and leg uh, in that order. Headache, um, usually the common classic after coughing, sneezing, straining, having a bowel movement. And the reason is, is because there's venous congestion, there's nowhere for that CSF to go. So there's a buildup uh, in the posterior fossa. Uh, neck pain, again, um, often patients are kind of holding their head um, in a certain way to kind of help um, even unconsciously um, with uh, a pain, headaches, things like that. And most of the neck pain is, is muscle related. Hearing balance problems, very common. Muscle weakness, particularly in the hands. And the first thing we'll look at in the office is hand intrinsic weakness and hand grip. Dizziness. Uh, vertigo, uh, uh, buzzing in the ears, problems with uh, fine hand uh, 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 movement, um, you know, dropping keys, dropping mugs, things like that. Um, typing, uh, patients will start to uh, uh, notice that. And that's usually later. Um, that's a later symptom. Difficulty swallowing, also very common. A lot of people don't ask about this. And sometimes um, it's not uncommon where that will be one of the earlier symptoms, particularly when there's brainstem uh, findings. And one of the things that we really, uh, I think, unfortunately, still gets blown off, um, but we have a better understanding of, and, and I was guilty of this um, uh, uh, earlier on in my career, a lot of these patients have fatigue, brain fog, memory loss. Um, they just don't feel right. And, you know, we're usually quick to, to sum that into, well, it's the stress of being diagnosed. You have these other symptoms. There's really no correlation between the cerebellum and brainstem with these symptoms. And, you know, again, if you don't look, you're not going to find it. So something in, in the cognitive literature, which, which Dr. Glebus and his colleagues are, are, are certainly very well aware of, is a cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. And, you know, that kind of led us to start thinking about Chiari differently and where the pathology is. Um, and that is, uh, we'll talk about that and why these patients actually do have an anatomic reasoning for this. And many of them will, this will uh, uh, get better once the surgery is performed. Not always, but uh, a, a clear subset of these patients. And the problem is that when there's misdiagnosis and poor communication, this worsens. You know, the fatigue, memory loss, um, brain fog, those are also signs of, of stress of um, uh, 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 certain type, uh, types of, of stress surges 
um, that neurochemically do cause these symptoms. So when you misdiagnose a patient or you, you kind of tell them out, it's not, it's, it, it's not real, it's in your head, it's anxiety, it, it kind of throws gas on fire. So education and understanding to reduce and to relieve that is really important because that alone is also another factor of once you start kind of relieving these patients' stress and anxiety over this, a lot of times the above gets better. So anatomically, you know, we now have a much, much better understanding, not in animal models, but in human functional topography, um, really through functional MRI. Um, so we know that executive function, emotion, um, spatial, working memory, um, there are areas in the brain that are clearly, clearly responsible for this in the cerebellum. And we know this, this is a, uh, a functional MRI, and we know this through tractography as well. You can see these hot spots in the bottom left hand uh, portion of the screen. And these are patients that are actually going through active tasks while they're on a MRI. And you can see these areas lighting up uh, much, much like we do in functional neurosurgery. And you can see that the cerebellum is indeed um, responsible for many of uh, uh, these symptoms. So that's why we need a Chiari Center. Um, and you can see that it takes a team. Um, Dr. Glebus, who's the head of our cognitive center, Dr. Lester, Dr. Gallo, um, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. Oleg Teitelbaum, who's the head of our uh, uh, Chiari Center for MRI uh, and, and has our three Tesla over at Mercy uh, uh, Fitzgerald, uh, one of our partner sites, um, is really able to put all these things together. So Dr. Lester and Gallo are, are neuropsychologists. Um, and are critical in helping us define, is this anxiety or is this really um, something going on from a neurochemical standpoint? So signs, once we start looking at patients in the office. So these are things that we see as physicians and healthcare providers in the office. Nystagmus is not uncommon. Again, if you don't look, you're not going to see it. It's usually a lateral nystagmus, but it can be um, up, uh, uh, upbeating nystagmus, six nerve palsy, um, esotropias, all those things are, are not uncommon. Gait difficulty, um, again, a later sign. Clumsy, frequent falls, bumping into walls, doesn't have to be obvious. It can be a young, healthy person who's starting to notice that they're tripping on stairs more frequently, bumping into things. Hand atrophy, um, really important to look at in the office. You, you can see uh, a hypo and a hyperthenar uh, atrophy and just that hand grip. Um, very, very important. Uh, weakness, especially in the arms, uh, or a heaviness patients will describe, um, and then sensory loss. And this cape distribution sensory loss, I think is something um, that's really more of an old school. I, I rarely see it. Um, doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And that's more common in a syrinx and even in those patients. Um, and we're going to talk about that later, what a syrinx is and, and symptoms, um, not as common. The sensory loss is usually more um, kind of vague, but it's usually in the arms. Um, and then fasciculations where you'll see the muscles kind of going into these little spasms. So on exam, the devil's in the details. Um, you know, migraines have over 100 types and subtypes with varying symptoms. So not everything is a Chiari, even if a patient has a Chiari. And we certainly don't want to recommend surgery to somebody whose only symptom is headaches. And it's clearly migraine only because we're going to treat the migraines get the headaches under control and follow the Chiari. Pain is very common, but it almost always fits a pattern. If it's this vague pain of, you know, kind of everything hurts. Uh, one of my tricks is I'll ask a patient if their hair hurts. Um, if they say yes, that kind of my antenna go up because uh, obviously hair has no nerve endings and shouldn't hurt. Um, weakness is specific. Um, it can't be this generalized weakness. That's very, very uncommon. Um, it's a weakness distributed in an upper extremity, um, doesn't have to be a perfect uh, motor dermatome, but it does have to be somewhat specific um, in pattern. If symptoms don't correlate, you're not going to get a good result. What you're going to get is an unhappy patient who has a big scar on the back of their neck and shows up in the office and the symptoms are still there, but they've undergone surgery. And if the first surgery doesn't help, you really have to question your diagnosis um, more surgery is likely to cause new problems. Um, and this is usually a big debate at some of our national meetings. Um, you know, some patients will kind of get up and, um, you know, talk about having 20, 30 surgeries for Chiari. Um, and again, if you don't believe me, just Google it, you'll see. 
that's a problem. If people are getting that many surgeries, that means there's a um, problem with the diagnosis. And this doesn't refer to complications. Everyone has complications. Uh, CSF leak, hyd delayed hydrocephalus infections. We're talking about quote unquote scar tissue that needs to be broken down, um, you know, reherniation, um, things like that, uh, or, or basically cervical instability, which is a whole nother topic. So facts and thoughts, which are mine, um, no science behind this, uh, just my experience. So take it for what it's worth. Um, up to 30% of patients are asymptomatic. Uh, that's actually a fact. Um, so that doesn't mean that every patient with a CRI needs to be operated on. Um, so we really have to focus on the patient before we start looking at the films. And again, no one dies of a Chiari. Um, there are, this is an extremely, extremely rare incident, um, particularly in adults, um, even in children, um, children can have cardiac arrest, apnea, things like that. Um, this is usually in young children who, um, before they're verbal and can really communicate, um, and severe cases, but essentially this isn't a glioblastoma. This isn't um, something that is, uh, um, you know, going to kill a patient. Um, it's really preventing long-term symptoms. So surgery is not a trial. It's permanent. I tell every one of my patients that um, it's not like a medication where you try and if you have side effects, it doesn't work. You stop it. You go to the plan B. You know, once you cut someone, that's it, it's permanent. So you really have to make sure the patient is um, the right candidate. Choose a treatment for the condition, not the symptom. Um, so basically, we're going to talk a little bit about this. If a patient has hydrocephalus and a Chiari, you really have to think about what you're treating first. And almost always, you're going to treat the hydrocephalus first. Um, and then this is a big one. If, you know, the most important takeaway, I would say, is that this degree of herniation has very limited prognostic value. You need clinical correlation. Um, and I'll show you some cases later in the talk where patients have these massive herniations, 10, 12, 13, 14 millimeters, and they really have mild or no symptoms. Whereas other people have five, six millimeters of um, uh, uh, descent and they're very, very symptomatic. Um, and so you really can't use a degree of herniation. So how do we diagnose um, and, and determine the best treatment for the patient? Well, as mentioned, it's a team. This is our Chiari Center and our Chiari team. Um, it really starts, you know, the first up there is Haley Fitzgerald, uh, who's our PA um, and heads up uh, the uh, uh, Chiari Center from an organization standpoint. She's a clinician who sees these patients in the office. Um, Dr. Glebus, uh, you've seen Dr. Uh, Lester and Gallo on the previous slide, Dr. Gallo, who's, a, I'm sorry, Dr. Ross, Jennifer Ross, the director of our research, um, Dr. Urban, who's the uh, head of our neuropharmacology, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Rami, uh, who is our, uh, my partner, a surgical partner for adult for Chiari, and Dr. Lovin, who's a director of our pediatric uh, neurosurgical program at St. Christopher's. Uh, who heads up uh, all the pediatric care of the carry patients, and uh, Dr. Teitelbaum uh, from uh, radiology. So it really does take a, a, a team, and that's why I think a center is critical. So let's go through a decision tree, real-time, real patients. Um, who should have surgery? Again, I can't emphasize enough, not all patients with Chiari need surgery. Um, and you have to keep that in mind because many patients will come in wanting the surgery and they want it because their symptoms they've been suffering with for a very, very long time. Um, they look online, they see that the chronic headaches they've been having, the neck pain, all these different types of symptoms could potentially be a Chiari. And even though most people don't want to have surgery, particularly something as invasive as Chiari surgery, um, they see this as a kind of magic uh, a pill to take care of all those symptoms. So you really have to keep that hat on and focus on that and not the patient pushing for surgery. Um, patients need to be informed and part of the decision. Everything has a risk, everything has a benefit, and you really have to go through a risk benefit ratio. And you also have to go out on a limb and give a recommendation. Um, you know, the idea of, well, you know, this is, this is what this is and, you know, you decide. Um, you know, sometimes I think we, tend to be a little bit um, shy on saying, this is what you need. And as long as the patient's part of that decision,
they really need guidance um, because they're going to get a lot of different answers. And unfortunately, they're going to get a lot of different scary things on the Internet. Correct diagnosis of symptoms is absolutely critical, um, as mentioned. And so who? Radiographic evidence. Uh, Chiari Zero, um, again, I bring that up. Uh, my personal opinion is it makes zero sense. Um, I don't even want to, um, I, I think I've given that enough, but you need radiographic evidence. If there's no radiographic evidence of cerebellar herniation, I'm not quite sure how you're going to help them with surgery. Um, and that will become evident as I show you what the surgery is. Clinical symptoms that are specific, not generalized, not um, uh, fatigue, generalized pain, nonspecific headaches, or clear migraines. First questions I'll ask my patients are, does the light bother your eyes? Do you have problems with loud noises? Um, there's classic triggers of, of migraines, and every day of the week, those patients need to undergo my treatment for those headaches before we even talk about surgery. So... If you don't believe me, then I can tell you that, uh, that, that it's kind of confusing and there's really no clear guide for who gets operated on and who doesn't. Aetna, in all their infinite wisdom, and we know how much Aetna cares about patients. Um, actually, I probably shouldn't say this. That's this is recorded, but uh, Aetna, these are their guidelines. They basically have guidelines of whether they'll pay providers and hospitals for Chiari malformation. So actually the insurance company is setting the guidelines of if you should have Chiari surgery or not. Um, and you know that I think is, is in of itself is telling um, that we need to do a better job of coming up with guidelines. So not all Chiaris are the same. So you can't have a protocol. You can't say if this, then that. You really, um, there's a science to it. And again, there has to be multiple uh, people involved um, who are experts in the field, but coming at it from different perspectives. So, you know, this patient on the left here, the five millimeters of minimal descent versus this patient that I talked about earlier, who has this massive descent, um, you know, of, I think this patient has like almost 15 millimeters. It's, it's starting to go below C2 here. So treatment, the treatment is basically this, um, it's removing the back part of the skull. That's, that's opening everything else, uh, uh, opening up. And then everything else is really freeing up the cerebellar tonsils. And the goal of the surgery um, is to really decompress and restore CSF. And I can't emphasize that enough. The ultimate goal is restoring CSF flow. And that's where our team uh, of our surgeons and radiologists uh, 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 colleagues are critical um, to a determine whether once we make that decision of yes, surgery needs to be performed, um, doing this both pediatric and adults. And this isn't something, a type of surgery that, oh, well, I like doing them. I do one or two a year uh, because there, there is some nuance to it, even though the surgery itself is not all that difficult. So you can see this is the back part of the skull um, and they're C1, C2. And this is a very crude, uh, I wish the surgery uh, was this straightforward, but it's a great illustrative video. So we basically remove this small portion of the skull. It's actually much smaller than that. If you take too much bone, which is the way um, I was trained 20 years ago, you'll get cerebellar sag. Once the bone plate is out, um, you can start to see kind of translucently. And I love this. The surgeon definitely did not make this. Uh, so you just see like forceps grabbing the dura, pulling it up, taking this massive scalpel and just cutting down. Uh, that surgery would end in massive hemorrhage very early uh, if this is the way it was done. But it, again, this is the type of incision we make. Um, it's usually done with loops or under a microscope. Um, and we make this kind of Y incision to open everything else up. You can see the top of the cerebellum and then the cerebellar tonsils, which are usually together and way herniated down, all the way down to C2. That's, that's what we see when we first open up. So it's critical to shrink those tonsils. Once everything's open, we sew this patch graph in. I'm also, also was very confused of how you're able to get sutures underneath the bone magically. But again, great illustration to kind of give you a sense of what this is. Um, so the patch graft, you know, what type of patch graft you use really doesn't matter. There's really no difference in material. There's different things you can use. I won't get too much into that, but there is debate over whether to even open that dura or not. Um, you know, if you don't open the dura, you can't really open and widen everything. Um, you're still going to be tight back there because you're just removing bone. And sometimes these kind of, um, bands that you cut, um, 
that will open it up a little bit, but um, this is where one of the debates between pediatrics and adults is really big. Um, but there are studies for this. Um, if you open the dura and do a tonsillectomy, meaning with cautery, shrink those tonsils. You buzz them with heat and they shrink up. So now you have this nice big open space before you put the patch on. That's been shown to have lower rates of recurrence, better improvement of syrinx and symptoms. The cost of it though, is there is a higher short-term complication because anytime you add something, you have another risk and you can get what's called a pseudo meningocele. seal. And that's where CSF starts to leak out through that patch. Um, and sometimes it does become, if it's a big leak, you have to take them back to the operating room and repair it. And if the patients keep having leaks, that's telling you that there's hydrocephalus and it's like a water balloon filling up. And that CSF just keeps going out the patch, uh, the path of least resistance. This is what it looks like uh, real time. Um, so you can see that kind of big Y incision down at the bottom here, this translucent area here, that's the arachnoid, uh, which we open up to shrink. Some people will leave this arachnoid intact and just leave this like this. That's actually okay, but it's next to impossible to do because even a pinhole leak in here is gonna cause a pseudomeningocele. These are the different types of patch grafts that we use just for illustrative purposes. So the goal of surgery, again, decompress. So this is a pre and a post. Decompress, shrink those tonsils, restore CSF. If I'm just taking bone off here, um, I'm not really long-term taking care of the problem. If you look on the right, those cerebellar tonsils are gone because they're shrunk all the way up here. And now you see this nice big open CSF space where the arrows are. So this is what I was referring to as what's called a cine flow. So this is where uh, Dr. Teitelbaum and his colleagues are very uh, um, helpful, where we can do these live uh, um, it, it, during an MRI, you can see the CSF pulsations. If this patient who has not had surgery undergoes this study and the CSF is freely flowing both in front and back or anterior and posteriorly in the frame and magnum, I'm not going to help them with surgery um, because they already have CSF flow. Now, if a patient's been operated on and they have recurrence of symptoms, and as this patient is, you can see they've already had a decompression, you can see everything's open here. Again, cerebellar tonsils shrunk, CSF is flowing in the back and in the front. I can now focus on those symptoms and not you know, worry that there's a problem with recurrence here. So let's talk real patients. So here's a 25-year-old female. Uh, I saw in the office, uh, severe neck pain, lack of energy, uh, debilitating headaches, usually worse around her period. Um, and this is her study. You saw it from before. She's a classic five millimeters of cerebellar descent. And the truth is, this is probably more like four millimeters. And I would probably call this low, low lying cerebellar tonsils. So let's now go to symptoms. Saw her in the office. Um, talked to her. High stress job. Just started um, a job. Got a promotion. Um, and she's not sleeping well for the past six months, getting about three, four hours of sleep. Neck is tender to touch, big trigger point uh, for diagnosis. If the neck's tender to touch, that's not neuropathic pain. Uh, that's a myopathic pain. So that's, that's muscle pain. Um, she has a history of childhood migraines, light sensitivity, loud noises, um, was actually treated um, early, early on, late in high school, early in uh, college, and then they kind of went away. Her exam's completely normal. She's a little hyperreflexive, but that's completely normal for a young female. So what's the plan here? Um, could get a CSF, uh, MRI CSF to show that there's flow, but she's got a lot of trigger points that are telling me these aren't from the Chiari. So we had her see uh, our, our migraine team, uh, a headache team. They treated her for migraines, changed her sleep habits, which is the biggest one. Um, she got a... Um, uh, orthopedic pillow, and basically everything went away. Uh, saw her in three months and literally all her symptoms. She was more grateful than most of the patients who've had surgery. So avoided surgery. Uh, uh, there's another patient, 42 years old, um, mild headaches, was noticed that she was actually dropping uh, objects. Uh, she came uh, with her husband and her husband was saying, you know, kind of correcting her that, no, you're dropping more things than you normally do. She was a little bit in denial. Did have neck pain. Uh, and also did feel unsteady. So on further questioning, she had tinnitus ringing in the ears, uh, did have difficulty swallowing all within the past three months. Um, her headaches were much worse when she was, particularly when she was lifting things, not so much coughing, but when she bent to lift things. 
on exam, severe hand intrinsic weakness, decreased gag reflex, was ataxic on walking, uh, and it was more of a truncal ataxia. And that was her MRI. Look at the degree of this. Um, and her symptoms were actually not as extreme for this type. And this is a type 1.5 because you can see brainstem uh, uh, is starting to really pull down here, the medulla. So her plan every day of the week is surgery decompression. So hydrocephalus, we mentioned this, and this is a, a, there's a great patient that we did um, about uh, six months ago. Um, so if you have hydrocephalus, you have to rule that out with an MRI or the CT of the brain on every carry patient. A lot of carry patients will present with just an MRI of the C-spine. So you really have to look at the head with a minimum of a CT to see if there's hydrocephalus. Um, and if there is hydrocephalus and a carry, I will always treat the hydrocephalus first um, because the pressure is coming from above and pushing down. And that's usually the cause of, of the Chiari. Um, after a patient has had Chiari sur surgery, if it's, the hydrocephalus is not obvious and they're having multiple CSF leaks after the surgery, then uh, a shunt's indicated. So here's a young 23-year-old uh, who basically was going to donate blood um, and had a syncopal event, but no one listened to her. Um, she went to multiple uh, docs and they're all, well, you, you were, you know, you got hypotensive, you were drawing blood, you probably didn't eat because you were fasting and you, you, uh, 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 you know, lost consciousness, not uncommon. Well, no one really listened to her. And the fact of the matter was she didn't, she didn't give blood and she wasn't fasting. She was in line to give blood. Um, she's been feeling multiple uh, episodes of near syncope prior to this, positional headache, worse when she bends, and started to notice double vision while driving. And her neck was getting more and more stiff over time. So this is her MRI. Um, and you can see, does she have a Chiari malformation here? Absolutely. Oh, without question. I don't need a cine flow. You can see there's obstruction of CSF. Um, and you can see there's probably an early syrinx going on here. Um, now, what else does she have on this study? Uh, she has, you can see if she just had a C-spine, um, which would be just looking at here, we would miss this. She has hydrocephalus. Th these are very large ventricles for a 23-year-old. She should have near slit ventricles. So her, she was very confused, went to four different places in the city, um, got a second opinion online from Cleveland Clinic, um, and had every recommendation known to man. So this is a case where, um, in my opinion, um, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, this is hydrocephalus and hydrocephalus needs to be treated first. So we did shunt her um, and actually in her three month follow-up, uh, she's gonna be getting an MRI in about two months, which I'll follow up on in my next talk. Um, uh, her symptoms have, have uh, um, all resolved. So controversies and recommendations, so let, let's, for, for the neurologists, primary caregivers, um, and people that see these patients in diagnosis first before we do, um, and we get a lot of these questions, um, I wanted to go over a couple um, controversies um, and opinions um, from literature to help. So pregnancy, this is not an uncommon thing. I've given a lot of lectures on this. It's not uncommon, particularly where Haley's getting a phone call from a panicked uh, OBGYN or a patient who is now three months pregnant, four months pregnant, has just diagnosed with a Chiari or has known they've had a Chiari. Um, we know in, in pregnancy that we do see new diagnosis of Chiaris because Valsalva worsens um, headaches and it also worsens uh, herniation. Why? Why does that happen? Because if we look at the venous sinuses, um, they're all in the posterior fossa. So the transverse sigmoid um, sinuses, um, are right back here and you can see how large they are. And when we cough, laugh, sneeze, ICP goes up, they engorge. When there's no room for the CSF and you have a blockage at the frame and magnum, you're now increasing this pressure. And we do know obviously during pregnancy that this uh, a blood volume increases and this becomes um, even worse. So delivering vaginally while you're doing these val constant long valsalvas um, can potentially be dangerous. So what's the recommendation? Um, if patients are asymptomatic, um, I'm okay with a vaginal delivery with a block. If there's a syrinx um, and or they're symptomatic, then we recommend C-section. And that, that's, that's been um, uh, um, 
you know, published, um, again, not huge series, a pretty comprehensive meta-analysis. Um, and in our experience, that's been pretty safe. Return to sports, another really, really big one. Um, it, it, once, and it's, it's also very important to um, clarify, pregnancy, sports, once a Chiari patient, patient with a Chiari has surgery and their Chiari is treated, they no longer have a, a Chiari malformation and have no restrictions. But return to sports with a Chiari, um, if they're asymptomatic and it's treated, they can return. Um, and we do know that if they have a concussion, their symptoms may be worse. Um, if they're untreated and they have symptoms and or syrinx, much like pregnancy, we uh, ask them to avoid contact sports. Neuropathic pain um, and headaches, uh, another issue. Um, patients that have syrinx uh, also often have these horrible um, neuropathic uh, 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 dysesthesias and pain. Opioid use is very high and patients develop a tolerance very quickly. Um, and we often don't do a good job of addressing this. Um, it's kind of everybody focuses on the Chiari and if it's headaches, it's kind of, um, you know, not addressed uh, uh, well and the headaches are treated like a migraine. Um, but for these types of headaches, it's not going to help. So before anything, you have to have the correct diagnosis of where the problem is. Is it the Chiari? Is it something else? Is it the syrinx? Um, and again, that's why you need a team. And that's where um, Haley Fitzgerald, Jen Ross from our research department and uh, Beata Urban from neuropharmacology are critical for helping with the diagnosis um, and also with trying to come to up for some answers. So alternative treatments for symptoms are um, really not discussed much. You know, these are patients that have failed everything else. We don't really ever talk about medical marijuana, acupuncture, physical therapy, headache management, you know, and going over some of these things that are uh, often can be extremely helpful. And I, I must admit, earlier in my career, um, I was as, I was guilty of this. I, I was kind of like, this is a surgical problem. You're you're not going to get relief from these things. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Jen Ross and and our team, uh, uh, actually a, a really great medical student from uh, Drexel, um, did a great meta analysis. It was recently published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine really doing a systematic review of um, non-opioid pain management for this patient uh, 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 population. And as expected, um, there's really next to nothing. Um, and so that kind of opened up a, a door for us. And we've been working on through a grant, um, a lot of our patients were taking medical marijuana. So we wanted to see, you know, does this help? If so, what patient population? Uh, so we prospectively started looking at enrolling patients that have already um, uh, retrospectively have been taking marijuana um, and we kind of polled them. And it was pretty, I, I have to say, I was very, very shocked. Um, uh, if you look, there's uh, um, 40, we're uh, I think up to 57 patients now, 20% um, noted reduced pain, 40% reduced, um, reduced pain, um, and uh, uh, up to a 40% uh, pain reduction, 60% uh, reduced pain. I'm sorry. So these are showing 20%, 40%, 60%, and 80% reduced pain uh, when we ask them uh, uh, to quantify it. Um, and only three patients exchange, uh, uh, describe no change in pain whatsoever. I think this better describes it. If you look at the middle here, uh, moderate, strong, very strong, uh, these three uh, uh, categories here, 27% um, of the patients, um, I'm sorry, 40% uh, moderate pain reduction, 38% of total patients strong, 6%, almost 100% relief. None of them had uh, um, un uh, untoward uh, side effects. Um, mood elevation, same thing. Decreased stress, again, you can see the same thing here. Um, but the sweet spots in the middle, the majority of the patients either had moderate or strong reduction in pain from using medical marijuana. And we did start to look at the different strains. This is where it became an issue of not um, all marijuana is the same, not all types of administration, whether it is uh, uh, an edible, sublingual, uh, they're inhaling it, uh, creams, things like that. So we found that um, Different uh, uh, strains were important. Sativa was one that was very uh, uh, helpful. I've become an expert in marijuana, that, not that I would have known before. 
67% uh, of patients reported stopping or lowering their doses of, of medication since starting marijuana. But look at some of these quotes from the study. Quit all prior meds, stop pharmaceuticals, I'm off all my uh, uh, opioids and fentanyl patch, no longer taking pain pills. Um, it really was remarkable. Um, so I want to finish here with syringomyelia, because this is another thing that kind of causes some confusion. So syringomyelia, what is syringomyelia? It is, and, and this is really uh, an important slide to look at because it gives you a better description that we don't really see on MRIs of the relationship of the ventricles and the central canal. So the fourth ventricle here in the posterior fossa, um, you can see that there is a direct conduit here into the central canal. Um, so the ventricles go right into the central canal, which is this thin line, um, uh, 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 ependymal line cavity, much like a ventricle in the spinal cord. You normally don't see it, even on a three Tesla MRI, because it's so small. But when there is a, a hydrocephalus or blockage of flow here, what ends up happening is the CSF outside of the spinal cord starts to go to the path of least resistance and will um, be drawn into the central canal and you get this large cystic cavity. And this is what it does look like. Um, and you can see, and it's not clear here that the fourth ventricle connects with the central canal, but you see this large syrinx. This is a whole different type of symptoms and a whole different type of urgency. These patients need decompression. Once this is decompressed in the posterior fossa and the CSF stow is re uh, uh, a flow is restored, up to 85%, and this is across almost every series and any um, neurosurgeon that you talk to that does these, 85% of the syrinx will spontaneously go away over time once the decompression or near complete resolution. Because now the pressure goes from path of least resistance from within the syrinx to outside uh, uh, the CSF canal. So um, the thought is by uh, uh, John Heiss, who's at NIH, that um, pulse pressure waves from the fourth ventricle into the central canal during this kind of piston valve uh, a mechanism causes this. Um, and that kind of uh, cardiac cycle, uh, you can see it, it's blocked. Um, and, and this is kind of an illustration from his, his original paper showing that. And again, it's like this piston uh, mechanism through uh, systole and asystole. And you can see the difference here. And again, we know this through uh, radiology. So facts of syrinx, 70% of them are associated with a Chiari. You can get them traumatically and sometimes spontaneously. But you also have to be very uh, aware that tumors, certain spinal cord tumors can cause this. So you always, always, always have to make sure the patient has an MRI with contrast to rule that out. Um, trauma is probably the most common cause after Chiari. Um, basilar invagination, uh, which is less likely, but you can see that. Symptoms um, are almost always pain. Um, and that's where you get into this cape-like distribution. These are these horrible, horrible neuropathic pain with the sensory uh, uh, um, uh, uh, dissociation uh, uh, of uh, uh, pain um, where they can't really distinguish between light pain, sharp pain, can't tell the difference between um, uh, uh, sensation in their arms. Um, which is the most common location of this pain is the back of uh, the shoulders and the arms. Um, and they can't really dissociate uh, uh, pain. So a lot of these patients uh, will feel pressure, but they'll come in with burns. And you can see patients will have burns on their hands, on their arms, because they're constantly not feeling either the stove or something hot. Um, and the reason for that is uh, this classic cape-like distribution is because of the, uh, the pain fibers are medial within the spinal cord. And when that syring starts to expand, that's where the stretch is. So it's sensory before motor. So conclusion, so I can leave a couple uh, minutes for questions uh, if there are any. Um, there's clear, the evidence is clearly lacking uh, for guidelines. So that's where um, we get into a lot of confusion and the patients get confused and, and can't emphasize enough the, the need for a team approach. Um, it's not a uniform disease. Um, there's Chiari syndrome which is the symptoms and everything else. But um, at the bottom of the line, at the end of the day, the bottom line is, is there a Chiari or not anatomically is a starting point. Every patient has to be evaluated individually. There's definitely no universal protocol. If you start doing that, um, really you, but mainly the patient's gonna end up in trouble. 
Um, and then the importance of uh, professional organizations um, that um, really are there to bring leaders together um, at an international level and, and, and meet and, and come up with um, guideline papers and pool our data, um, uh, much like William Keating, uh, who headed up that, that study of trying to finally sort out the difference between adults and children. Um, and with that, I will uh, finish. Thank you, and I will take any questions. Travis, thank you very much. It was a great talk. Actually, it was very clear. And some of the aspects of Chiari, even I, you know, I learned it, especially about the treatments. Uh, we do have several questions for you. And let me open that. So should Chiari patients routinely get Cineflow uh, CSF study? That's a great question. It comes up a lot. Um, I don't think so, because if you look at the data and people that don't get it point to some of the data saying that we don't have enough data to say it's prognostic. That's not what I get them for. I get them for those patients that are right on the fence. The symptoms are there. They've got, you know, five, six millimeters of cerebellar descent, but I can't really put my finger on it. If there's obstruction of flow, that really helps me with my surgical planning. Because now I can say, look, there is obstruction of flow. I'm helping them. It's also extremely helpful postoperatively if patients still have some symptoms to see if there's still some obstruction of flow. Um, but routinely, no, I don't. Like that one patient that had, I, I showed with the 17 millimeters of descent, that patient, it's not going to, I don't really need uh, a Cine flow. Sometimes carry patients have a constellation of the vague symptoms, such as non-focal headache, brain fog, maybe tinnitus, but really nothing focal. How do you follow these patients? Another great question. Again, it's a team. Um, I'll call Dr. Lester or Gallo and, and you, Dr. Glebus, as you know. Um, and we'll start to look at underlying and, and neuropsych formal neuropsychological testing is critical. Um, but if that's all there are, um, I'm going to, that's where Cine flow will be helpful as well. But those are patients, if those are their only symptoms, hard pressed to recommend surgery. When, if ever, do you drain the syrinx? And if you do, how do you drain it? it is, do you shunt it or do you just aspirate? <laughs> Another great question. And clearly from a neurosurgeon, because we've all gone down this rabbit hole. I don't. Um, have I done it? I have rarely. Did we used to do it um, for people like me who have gray hair on their head? Um, those usually end up helping only temporarily, almost because it's a low pressure system that the tubing gets clotted. Um, you can really hurt the patients um, as well because the spinal cord is pretty small. My experience is it doesn't help long term. Um, so I, I rarely will um, shunt them. In those patients you follow and you don't operate on, do you ever see progressive atrophy of the tonsils? Um, you know, that's a really interesting question. The answer is I don't know, because um, I don't know that I've ever looked at it. Um, uh, you know, in those patients that we don't operate on, um, I don't know that I've ever seen progressive shrinkage of tonsils, but I will tell you, I have a handful of patients with pretty big curiaries and syrinx, and one of them is 72 now. I see her every year. Um, and, uh, her symptoms get better. Um, but I don't really see the cerebellar tonsils, but I don't know the answer because I've never really followed it. For the patients you operate on, uh, how long does your post-op follow up? You know, how long do you follow them? Uh, actually Haley can probably answer this question better than I do because she sees it. Um, I would say that almost every patient that I've treated, um, for, you know, close to 25 years, um, they'll come back. They will always come back. And some of them just want to be checked in on yearly, but I don't do yearly MRIs at all. I go by their symptoms. And if they're having new symptoms, I'll get an MRI. Um, and I tell my patients after a year that unless they're having symptoms, they don't need to see me. And uh, LP in somebody who has Chiari. <laughs> Another great question. So um, no, no, um, that, that's one of the few absolute no's. And I've seen some disasters with that. And some patients um, actually get Chiari's because of frequent LPs um, for whatever reason. Um, they're getting tested, they have cancer, they're undergoing immunotherapy. Um, so it, that, that is an absolute contraindication. What to do with those patients if somebody presents you suspect they might have meningitis and you do need an LP and you know that they have, you know, if you don't know that they have carry, you're just going to LP them. But if you know that they have carry, what, what, what are the options to get the CSF? Um, so there's two. And it depends. Again, every case is different. It really depends on the degree of herniation. 
Um, you know, if it's this low lying cerebellar tonsils, I would get a cine flow. If there's CSF, I would do small needle, get, you know, just a few CCs for culture and sensitivity. If it's a clear full blown Chiari, um, you can do a high uh, 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 a cervical that some people recommend, but I don't because it's to me, it's the same thing. Um, you either treat the meningitis um, based on if you have other cultures and then ultimately, if it's severe enough, a ventriculostomy, um, you go in and you get a, a, a CSF sample. And if it's truly meningitis more times than not, they're going to have um, uh, uh, hydrocephalus and high pressure anyway. Yeah. But those are tough cases. And I'll finish with a, with this question. So why there is a lag in the clinical symptom development? I mean, these people, you know, average start, they're having their symptoms. Obviously, they have this malformation, but they start their symptoms in their 40s, 50s on average. So why there is this, this lag? Well, and it, that's a great question. I think it helps us to try to understand why people get Chiari's, because clearly um, this is something that, that develops over time. Um, and as we get older, it should get better, right? Because as the brain atrophies. Um, so I think it's, it's multifactorial. My personal opinion is I think the underlying cause of Chiari is a hydrocephalus. I think it's a like glaucoma. I think it's an uh, overproduction or underabsorption of the CSF. Um, and as that kind of starts to accumulate um, uh, over time, you, you just kind of get this pressure where there, there's a herniation. Um, some people, it's there's a traumatic event. Um, but the answer really is we don't know. And the only way we're going to sort these things out and get more answers is these larger multi-center uh, uh, consortiums of just collecting our data, retrospectively looking at patients. Um, but really, no one knows the answer to that. At least certainly I don't. Dr. Best, thank you very much for this great talk. And thank you very much for opening this another great to be grand round season at GNI. Um, uh, see you back in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.